you dream of a classroom where learning is natural? Can we inspire students to lifelong learning? What exactly is the purpose of an education? Inspiring students to be curious, independent, creative, innovative, deep thinking, confident, proactive, collaborative, determined, educated. Rise to the challenge of changing the world. This is teaching. This is learning. This is who we are. Welcome to the Tabletop Inventing Podcast. Welcome to the Thanksgiving episode of the Tabletop Inventing Podcast. On today's show, we'll be speaking to a community college professor. Has student preparation for college changed in the last 15 years? What is the secret of learning how to learn? Want to know how to do a quick refurb on your laptop? Stay tuned for the answers to these questions on today's podcast. Happy Thanksgiving, Innovation Nation. I started this episode on Wednesday, and I'm already in the Thanksgiving spirit. I want to start this episode by saying thank you to Laura Fleming for leaving us a review in iTunes. Laura says that the TTI podcasts make you stop and think about the most relevant issues in education today. Well, thank you, Laura, for all those kind words. And if you'd like to give us a shout out on the podcast, just stop by the Tabletop Inventing podcast page in iTunes and leave a rating and a review. If we've earned five stars, let us know why. And if we haven't, we'd also appreciate your honest feedback. On today's episode, we're going to start right off with our interview. So be sure to stay tuned for today's great inventor secrets because we're going to reveal how to refurbish your laptop within minutes. But first, our interview with Suzyama. Suzyama has taught web development at Saracosa Community College for 15 years. Prior to Saracosa, she was a graphic designer and web designer and commercial illustrator. In addition to a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Visual Communication and a Master's of Science in Education with emphasis in online teaching and learning, Susie is currently pursuing a Master's of Science in Human Nutrition. This fascinating community college professor has very eclectic interests, including education, philosophy, theology, economics, ecology, and health, in addition to her graphic arts. Susie, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, um, my career has evolved. I started out as an illustrator uh, working for a defense contractor and um, became interested in graphic design and did a lot of self-teaching, self-training, and then started freelancing just as the web was getting started. So um, I had the really exciting opportunity to kind of be a part of the web movement as it was, um, you know, just starting out. I, I designed my first website in 1995, and it's funny because, you know, I talk to high school students that come up to the college to um, learn about what programs we offer, and they are now at the age where they were not yet born <laughs> when I designed my first website, so I feel really old. Um, but it's been really fun to see all the changes that have gone on in the web industry. And uh, so when a full-time position came um, opened uh, at Saracosa for web design, I applied and I uh, was fortunately hired. So I just had a lot of fun in building that program and um, seeing my students go through the program and graduate and become, you know, proficient designers themselves. And, um, and then along the way, I also got my master's degree in, in education. Um, and I, I really love teaching online. I think it's, it's a great um, medium to, to teach because it's it, it's a sort of an equalizer. Um, I've had students in the classroom that were extremely shy and didn't really participate and engage. Um, but in the online environment, they, you know, they're just very extroverted and, and participate just as much as anybody. So um, it's, it's sort of very democratic, I think. It gives other, you know students all a voice that they can, um, you know, participate in offer their, their opinions and things like that. That's yeah, interesting. I love what I'm doing. <laughs> so with your perspective as a community college professor, uh, you received the products of the K-12 education system. Mm -hmm. um, 
What's your perspective on the State of the Union in K-12 education? Well, it seems to me, this is just purely my own experience, that it seems as though students are less and less prepared to complete college-level work. Um, and it's not just with respect to reading and writing skills. Um, Part of it has to do with um, self-regulation skills and being able to manage their time well or, um, or set goals and, um, you know, meet that goal. So I don't, I don't really have a lot of personal involvement with what goes on at the K-12 system. Um, I, I actually am a board member for a charter school, but I don't get involved in the curriculum, so I'm not sure what what you know they're doing that's different than in the past, but it, um, it seems to me as though students are less and less prepared um, when they get to the college level, and it's a huge concern. Interesting. So you've been teaching for 15 years, and over those 15 years, you you kind of have the perspective that over time they have become less mm -hmm. prepared. And you mentioned yeah. specifically that they that it was in some soft skills. As far as uh, self-regulation, you mentioned specifically, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. what are some of the hard skills that, or are there any hard skills that that are also seem um, underprepared? Well, um, younger students are fairly computer literate, um, and my students range in ages um, across the spectrum. It's, it's primarily older students that are probably less computer literate, um, people that have been doing other sorts of traditional type jobs and are changing careers and need to, you know, um, use a computer more. Um, they have, they're having a hard time. But with respect to the younger students, they're, it seems to me as though they, they, they're pretty well prepared um, with respect to the hardware skills and software skills. Do the students in your classes have to do much uh, writing or reflecting or deeper thinking, you know, beyond sort of the, the typical design skills? Like, do you have, like, writing projects and other things they have to do? Yeah, um, it depends on the class. Um, in my accessibility and visibility class, they have to reflect quite a bit on um, the needs of disabled users and what sorts of strategies can technical um, solutions are needed to help um, accommodate them, but they do some reflection because it's an ethical issue too, and they have. To, I'm trying to convey to them or help develop within them um, uh, a desire to to meet those needs. I want them to care. I don't want them just to have the technical skills, but to really feel in compassion for um, other other people that um, you know may need that extra accommodation. And then there's a term paper at the end of that class, too. Um, others of my classes, like uh, the entry-level HTML coding class, pretty technical. There's um, not a lot of, um, you know, conceptual types of things to, re to reflect on in that class. It depends on the class, but overall, within the program, that there, there are many opportunities for them to do that. So I'm going to flip the questions and we're going to take a left-hand turn here. Um, okay. So you teach uh, web development. So okay. in this age of, you know, Internet wisdom where we can go out to Google and type just about anything in there or uh, do a search on Wikipedia for something we want to know, mm -hmm. and essentially, you know, we can look like we're a lot smarter than we actually may be, uh, what, is it, what, is that, what does it mean to be educated in this environment? Well, to be educated means that you can synthesize information. If anybody, like you said, can go out there and grab facts, you know, and, and grab bits of knowledge, but synthesizing that and then, you know, analyzing it requires critical thinking skills. And that's what we should be, you know, preparing students to do. And assessments should be authentic. We should be... Um, ensuring that, that um, the assessments that we give students are based on real-world applications 
and not just on um, asking them to repeat that, to keep back to us what we've told them. And it should be thinking about problems to solve. And that, that really is, I guess, um, the essence of real world application is problem based learning. So in, in your classes, uh, what types of things do you ask from students in order to elicit that type of thinking? Well, um, in the capstone class, we the students work in a group to produce a website for a real client. Um, and I usually am able to find a nonprofit association that needs a website. <clears throat> and so they're interacting with the client all semester long, working in a team and rotating the role of project manager. And um, so this, you know, in my field, in this discipline, that's about as real world as you get. And so they, you know, I'm, I'm there as a facilitator, but they're getting the, the parameters of the project from the client and submitting phases of their work to the client for the client's feedback um, and approval even. They can't, they, and they have to, um, put together a fairly detailed um, 20 or so page project proposal detailing lots of minutia about the project. And they cannot do any coding. They can't do any work on their website until the client signs off on that and, and agrees that, that, that they're on the same page and there's been a meeting of minds and that, um, that, that the plan is, is good to go. And then leading up to that, I mean, um, in another one of my classes, uh, students get a really in-depth um, experience working in groups um, over a period of four weeks. And um, so they are critiquing different aspects of websites as a group and co-authoring a report um, so that is getting them accustomed to working together. To get down to the point where students are learning how to learn and they're learning some uh, good habits in their education mm -hmm. and they're learning to synthesize these different uh, realms of knowledge that, that they come in contact with, how do we implement a system that helps students achieve that purpose in some sort of a meaningful way? Number one is creating a really vibrant learning community and one in which um, it's, it's not the instructor as the authoritarian, you know, dispensing knowledge may have to regurgitate it, but having it be much more collaborative and having there be a lot more interactions between students and, and having the expectation that they teach each other too. We, we do that a lot in the online environment. In, in the physical classroom, I think that would be equally important. Um, so the the question we always try to get down to in the podcast somewhere as we get uh, further down in the conversation is what is the purpose of an education? So from your perspective in the community college system, what, what is the purpose of an education? In my view, it's teaching a student how to really think and how to learn. Because after they get done <clears throat> going through their associate degree program or their certificate, um, we're, we hope that they'll be lifelong learners, whether they go on to a four-year school or whether they just keep um, learning on their own. I mean, even as web designers, you know, um, there's, things are constantly changing and um, it's absolutely essential to stay um, current with what the industry is doing and we have to be lifelong learners. So that's a big part of education. In my view also, education should be inter interdisciplinary because really uh, that, that nourishes the imagination and innovation actually occurs in, in, my, in my view as a result of some connections that we make. That we, they're pulling from different bodies of knowledge that we know. Um, for example, I understand that Gutenberg um, worked in the wine industry, and his knowledge of the mechanics of a wine press was what nourished his imagination to come up with the printing press. And so I think the more we can know about a lot of different things, even if it doesn't have to be depth of knowledge, but 
enough about enough different things um, can really give us an advantage in in creative thinking and in innovating and in how to problem solve and see and then see problems around us and think of ways to solve those problems. Excellent. Well, thank you, Susie, for taking some time to share your thoughts on education. And yeah. before we wrap up, uh, is are you interested at all if people listen to this podcast and want to get in touch with you? Are you interested in sharing how they might be able to do that? Certainly. I can um, provide my email address. Mm -hmm. um, well, you can do that or a website, anything. How can, how can our listeners get in touch with you if they find uh, that they want to pursue this conversation further. They, they can email me at sama at saracoso.edu. So sama at saracoso.edu. Yes. Excellent. Thank you so much, Susie. I appreciate you taking a few minutes to speak with us, and we'll, okay. hopefully, we'll, hopefully we'll be able to talk again soon. Okay, great. Thank you. I want to thank Susie for dedicating herself to teaching at a community college. Community college teachers are the backbone of the re-education system in this country. Students at a community college range in age from 15 or 16 up to 80 or 90. If you need a skill, your local community college is the closest, most likely place to learn that skill. The teachers at a community college tend to take just a little more time to help students understand the subject or to find a solution. So today, we're saying a great big thank you to all those community college teachers out there who share their time every week to change the lives of thousands and thousands of students. As I already said at the beginning of the podcast, I'm totally into the Thanksgiving thing already this year. I was thinking about my top three reasons for being thankful. And I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll be honest, I'm having a lot of trouble narrowing it down to just three. So perhaps, perhaps I'll just tell three stories. I am so thankful for my dad. He has been an inspiration for, to me all my life. He's the one that taught me to ride a motorcycle, drive a car, and load a boat onto a trailer. He taught me loads of other stuff too. Outside of the small town where he lives, yeah, he's not famous. But to the residents of our little community, he seems to know just about all the teenagers and their parents. Yet, he's never let any of that go to his head. As a small business owner, he gets up between 5 or 6 in the morning and heads out to the office around oh, 6.30 or 7, and occasionally as early as 5.30. He is a hardworking, humble son of an immigrant from Hungary. My great-grandparents immigrated to the U.S. around 1910 and got straight to the business of becoming Americans. So, my dad has always done what he saw my grandfather do, work hard to serve the people that depend on him. I guess as a kid I never really appreciated why that might matter. As a teenager I was like any other sophomore, which <laughs> literally means wise fool in Greek. So one day in February, while I was a sophomore, I announced that I thought we should take out our ocean kayak to the river. Now to be fair, this February day uh, in the eastern U.S. Uh, had gotten all the way up to 65 degrees Fahrenheit, which in the Appalachian Mountains is virtually a heat wave in February. Never mind that it was still February and that the river was flooded to its highest level in 10 or 15 years. Now at this point, my dad could have said, That's about the craziest idea I've ever heard. I am not letting you take the kayak out today, and if you do, don't say I didn't warn you. However, my normally conservative father did something I can only see now as uh, protecting me and affirming me. My other friends and my brothers had turned down the opportunity to kayak the river in February, and my dad probably saw the resolve in my face to go no matter what anyone else said, and decided to volunteer just to keep an eye on me. So we went out to the river with the kayak. My brother dropped us off and said he'd pick us up at the next bridge. Now to be fair, we put on our heavy coats just in case, and the flood stage river had really just lazily overflowed out into the surrounding fields. As my dad and I pushed away from the shore, it seemed like the perfect day. We paddled down the river and soaked in the sunshine and the swishing of our paddles and the slight breeze in our faces as we floated down the river. 
And at the first bridge where my brother met us to pick us up, we were having so much fun, we, we told him to meet us at the next bridge. So he floated down the river a ways more and had a great time paddling out into the fields well past the normal bounds of the river. Ah, it was really a lot of fun. Uh, truthfully, I've always enjoyed spending time with my dad, even though he often worked us pretty hard before we could go goof off. So uh, we just had a great time. And when we reached the next bridge, we told my brother again, hey, meet us at Lost Bridge, which is only about a mile and a half downstream from there. Yeah, it was getting a little bit late in the afternoon, so we thought we should wrap it up soon. And as we came around the next bend, came up to the next bend in the river, I saw a branch you know, kind of bobbing up and down in the water at the edge of the river. What disturbed me about that branch, though, was that it had ice forming on the end. As the afternoon had progressed, we simply hadn't noticed it was getting colder because we'd been paddling and staying pretty warm. It was, however, February in the Smoky Mountains, and looking back, that branch was probably a warning that I missed because as we rounded the next bend, a sight met us that was at once exhilarating and terrifying. I'd been down this section of the river quite a few times, and there were normally several huge rocks riding out, rising up out of the river, maybe eight to ten feet. But this time when I looked down the river, all I could see was rushing water. Now this water was not like anything I'd ever seen. I mean, I'd been whitewater rafting plenty of times before this, and there were definitely but these, these were definitely class four or five rapids, where normally they would have been a class one. In a flash, I realized what had happened to our slow, lazy, flooded river. It had been plowing through the wide valleys, but now it had been forced into a narrow canyon, and all that water had to go somewhere. And so it just rose right up and over those rocks that used to be there, and we couldn't see a trace of those rocks. It was a completely different river. Now, I've always been one for adventure, so I put on my game face and yelled back to my dad to hold on, because it's fixing to get a little bumpy. Woohoo! Man, that was a blast. We began to pick up speed as the river catapulted between the steep mountain walls, and for about two minutes, we aimed down the river with that ocean kayak. Uh, not really built for class four or five rapids on the river, but... We navigated a f couple of touchy spots, and there were, l I mean, there were literally waves standing in the middle of the river in the same spot, four or five feet tall. I have never seen anything like this before since. It was amazing. We're, we're just too busy staying upright to worry. Then the unthinkable happened. We had managed to navigate ah, maybe a half to three quarters of a mile down that wicked cool, those wicked cool ra rapids. And then dead ahead, there was a three or four foot drop. We'd just come around a corner, and we didn't really have time to set up for it. And what came before had been these waves, you know, just up and down, not gentle by any means, but this, this was an abrupt drop, like three or four feet, just almost straight down. And for the first time, I got a little pit in my stomach. What else could we do? The river was not about to let us off this wild ride, and we were terrified of approaching the shore and maybe getting caught in some bushes or drowned. I mean, literally, that's a major drowning concern near the edge of a flooded river, uh, getting caught up in some trees and getting pulled under. So we aimed straight ahead and hoped for the best. But at the last minute, we got just the slightest shove from one side, and it got a little sideways. The results were disastrous. The vicious current ripped the kayak and our protection from the roiling, frigid current straight out from under us. In an instant that I can still see like a freeze-frame movie in my head, we were plunged under the water. Mercifully, when we surfaced, the kayak was right next to us, and as we climbed back on, the river didn't seem to move. In fact, as we got seated, we actually had to push away from the precipitous drop in the river. <laughs> it was probably some sort of miracle that we didn't drown on the spot. Because looking back in my mind, there must have been a wicked backwards eddy in the river. Because in the 30 seconds or so that it took to mount the kayak, we hadn't moved an inch downriver. I still have several freeze frame shots in my head from that day. And one of them 
as a pulling away from our first dunking that day. Yet, unlike the movies in which there is only sight and sound, our mind's eye has emotions, sense, random thoughts, and tactile sensations. I remember the grim emotion of the moment, wondering if we were going to live or die. I remember the crisp, cold, damp smell of the tumultuous river, and the random thought, wow, I can't feel my hands on the paddle. <laughs> it was true. I remember the creepy, surreal lack of feeling. The only way I knew we were pulling away from the iron grip of the river was that I could see my hands moving rhythmically and the shore beginning to fall away behind us. Stoically, I wondered how soon we would again be unceremoniously tossed from the thin plastic protection that momentarily floated us again down the river at breakneck speed. We didn't have to wait long. We only managed to keep the prow aimed downstream for about another 30 to 60 seconds before the icy iron arms of the river pulled us again from our protective perch. This time, when we surfaced, we were floating downriver much too fast. My dad and I both tried to pull ourselves back above the water, but we were too weak. In less than five minutes, our bodies were beginning to succumb to the inexorable wi will of the river's chill. In my mind, I still see the shore rushing by in snapshots for those, I don't know, minute or two that we were floating down in the water. And then my dad yelled at me that we should find a place to beach the kayak and get out. Twice we tried and twice we were ejected. And on the third time, I caught a tree in one unfeeling leaden arm. I wrapped around one, the tree and with the other, I reached around and grabbed the rope at the front of the kayak. I knew we only had moments to get up and out of the water before the arms of the river prevailed against our waning strength. My dad told me to get up first. With a titanic effort and a little push from him, I finally made it up onto the kayak. We were going to survive this harrowing experience. But I turned to help my dad out of the river, and he just wasn't there. I mean, he'd just been there a moment before. I frantically searched the water, ready to dive in and pull my dad out of the water, and then I saw him. <laughs> he was already a hundred yards down river. I weighed my options in a split second and realized that if I jumped back in the river, I was a dead man. The alternative was just as awful. My dad would float down river out of my ability to catch him, but maybe I could outrun the river. I climbed up the tree that I'd tied the kayak to and jumped toward shore maybe five or six feet. When I splashed down, my plans began to splinter. I, I couldn't feel a thing. I mechanically kept my balance from years of jumping, but all my prowess had fled away. It was as if I was trying to control a body that was not my own. Only by seeing with my eyes and looking down at my legs did I even know I was moving. Ah, I could never run like this. As I stepped out onto the dry shore, I stared up at an insurmountable mountain. My hopes for chasing my, down, my dad down river were slipping away as quickly as the river's current. In desperation, I looked up and around for any signs of humans and hope. Nothing. There was a barn and a house on the other side of the river, but I knew I could never make it across, with my body refusing to aid me like it was. Then I looked up in a different direction. And there, just a hundred feet up a steep climb, was one of the most beautiful sights I've ever seen. It was a clothesline, with jeans and a couple of t-shirts waving in a gentle breeze. There were people up there. I commanded my right leg to move forward, and it grudgingly complied and I commanded my left leg to move forward I mean my limbs felt like they were full of lead and my nerves told me nothing yet somehow step by step I managed to scale that hill up to the clothesline as I crested the rise my eyes looked in in at a typical rural Appalachian scene an unfinished house with a cobbled together look my stumbling feet managed to carry me the remaining 50 feet across the driveway to the house. I don't honestly remember much about it except that it had a sliding glass door and that that door was separating me from a few men sitting on a couch. I knocked in the glass. From inside, all the men looked up at once, and for a moment they stayed rooted in place. <laughs> my heart sank. 
my dad's chances of survival were quickly fading. The swift current of the river made getting out treacherous, and he must by now be another couple of minutes downriver. Then one of the men rose from the couch. <laughs> I remember thinking, I wonder if he's going to help me out or shoot me on the spot. I'd heard stories. The sliding glass door opened, and I didn't wait for any salutation. I just stammered between violently shuddering and clenching jaw. My, my, my da dad's in the, in, in the river. And it was all I could get out. He turned and said something that I, at the moment, couldn't comprehend. And one of the other men jumped up and ran past me out the door. A moment later, uh, that man and another man pulled me inside, shepherded my feet, which were beginning to be much less cooperative at that point, into a small bathroom. We seem, it seemed like just a few seconds had passed, and I realized that the house wasn't centrally heated. In fact, it wasn't really any warmer inside than it had been outside. <laughs> With my blunted thinking, I, I kind of wished for some warmth, but none seemed to come. Someone began to help me pull off my soggy, dripping coat and then my shirt. I, I was barely able to function by this point. I, I couldn't really move. I was shuddering uh, terribly. Then a few minutes later, a kerosene heater appeared from nowhere out of the hallway into the bathroom, and my body was crying out for warmth, but my heart only wanted to see my dad. Then he appeared as if by magic, and his coat and his shirt were also removed so the warmth of the heater could begin to reverse the will of that callous, icy river. And only then did I realize that I had been shaking violently. My jaw was convulsing involuntarily, making my teeth clatter, <laughs> just like you see in all the old Looney Tunes cartoons. It, it would have been funny, except for the gravity of having such a close shave with death. After five or ten minutes, some feeling began to return, and then another group of men appeared at the bathroom door. <laughs> Evidently, someone had called 911, and normally the trip from town to this location would take like 20 minutes, but the crew made it in a record ten minutes flat. The man began asking us questions. The answers were a little slow in coming at first. Our brains were just so foggy uh, with the warming up and trying to get our body back. But in short order, our wits began to return as our core temperatures rose back to a safe range. And in the end, we told them we didn't think we needed to go to the hospital. And so they uh, got back in the ambulance, and I guess they went back to town. I, I, we don't really know because <laughs> they just disappeared out of the bathroom. In the meantime... My brother magically appeared through the door. He'd uh, either heard the ambulance or you know, maybe, maybe uh, my mom had been looking for us. I, he, he says that, that the word had traveled fast around town that somehow a couple of guys had fallen in a river. And you know, so in the days before Facebook, uh, that, had been, that was almost instantaneous as far as I'm concerned. But he somehow managed to connect with my, wa my mom and get up to the house. I have never been so grateful in my life as to be rolling up our driveway about 30 minutes later. I still remember stopping just inside the front door and turning to my dad. I looked at him and thought about how lucky I was to have a dad who would go out on this kind of a crazy adventure with me, practically save my life by pushing me out of the hungry river. My dad is and always has been a hero of ep epic proportions. I am so thankful to have such an amazing father. My second story is about a friend. He was a freshman when I was a junior. Scott always did have a mischievous grin. It probably got him into trouble because <laughs> he just looked so guilty sometimes. But he really was a great kid. <clears throat> In our high school, we all learned to work with our hands as much as with our heads. Part of our curriculum was driving tractors, milking cows, mopping floors, and working in the school cafeteria. We all got our fair share of work, and slackers were never really appreciated because it meant more work for the rest of us. So when as a junior I found myself on a work crew to do some weeding in the garden with the freshmen, I was not pleased. Freshmen hadn't been broken in, and they goofed off a lot, and that meant I'd be pulling much more than my fair share of the load. Fortunately, Scott was part of that crew that particular day. And I remember, as the crew leader, having to keep bringing those guys back to the task at hand. All except Scott. He just got down on his hands and knees with me and got the job done while the other two jokers just goofed off. That experience gave me an appreciation for Scott's hard work ethic. 
Scott's family pulled him out of the high school in the middle of the year in favor of a school closer to their home, so I lost touch with Scott. Almost 15 years later, I was checking my newly minted Facebook account and noticed a friend's post about it being an anniversary of Scott's death. I was shocked. When did this happen? Facebook was still quite new, so I, I looked around online and some other places and found a few details. And then I got back on Facebook to ask around with my friends. Come to find out, Scott had been engaged to Melissa, who is the sister of another one of my good friends, Jason. And Scott had been in Iraq in January 2005 on patrol. He and his unit were tasked with protecting and keeping the polling locations safe for the Iraqi elections set to happen in four days. As they were on patrol, Scott was in the gunning turret of their Humvee scanning for danger when they were hit by a rocket-propelled grenade or an RPG. The other three soldiers were injured, but Scott, uh, he was killed instantly by the blast. As I read the accounts online, my mind reeled. He was such a great friend. I mean... I, I guess he wasn't really a kid anymore, but, man, it was all hard to take in. The other guys in his unit described him this way. One said, he's the type of person who's always there to lend a hand, a person you could count on in battle and never worry if he, worry if he had your back. And that was Scott, all right, trustworthy, faithful, to the end. When he died on January 26th, he only had 51 days to his wedding with Melissa. My heart was heavy as I read the details and the dates. How could this have happened? Another account I read online described the funeral. I called up a friend who'd kept up with Scott much better than I had, and he corroborated the, the, the details that I'd read online. Evidently, when he was returned to his hometown of Weaverville, they shut down quite a few businesses to honor one of their own. A horse-drawn hearse took him through the streets of his hometown to his final resting place. I can't even imagine the pain and the heartache that Melissa faced as she watched her dreams slowly carried through the streets and then buried, never to be revived. How do we honor such sacrifice? I mean, can we rightly honor this devotion and patriotism in some way? Even as I read the accounts again this morning, I, I got, I'll got i be honest, I got misty-eyed. I had to stop. The, the photo on the militarytimes.com page shows a brave and a handsome young man. <laughs> I mean, when I look at that picture, I can still see the mischief in his eyes. But it's tempered with discipline, experience, and, and something else. Resolve. To serve to the end if necessary. I am deeply grateful today to live in a free America. The price is high. And today I'd like to thank every family that has ever given up their dreams so that another family can pursue theirs. We can never repay such kindnesses. It's not, it's not a fair trade. But I believe that Scott would want me to continue pursuing my dream to create a generation of young thinkers, creators, and inventors. His sacrifice should not be in vain. Scott, Melissa, wherever you are, I know there's nothing I could give to earn the gift of my freedom. I just hope that my life's work will honor your sacrifice. Thank you. My final story is really just a short anecdote. Two years ago during the holidays, my friend Darren asked me to come along with him to East Tijuana to take presents to some kids across the border. I live just three hours away, and yet, in some ways, it's on the other side of the universe. In America, I have a nice house. I mean, I have eight kids. I know that's a lot of kids. Only five of them are still at home. But when we bought the house, there were eight of us to fit into our four walls. And we decided we needed a little more room because our 1,800 square foot home at the time was just beginning to burst at the seams. Then I saw Ruth and Alex's home. 
After delivering the presents, we are invited home to their house to visit. Ruth speaks very good English, but her husband Alex is a little self-conscious about his English, and he tends to stick to his native tongue most of the time. They're amazing people, but their whole house would fit into my living room. Not because I have an enormous living room, but because their house can't be more than 300 square feet. In fact, I doubt it's more than 250 square feet. That's just 30% of the size, one-third the size, of a modest single-wide mobile home. Truthfully, I'm an American, and that means by its very definition that even if I am poor in America, I am in the top 5% of the world's richest individuals just by being in America. I hope my efforts to inspire a generation of American innovators will yield several who tackle the issues of global poverty. We have a debt to the rest of the world to teach them how to create the same freedom and privilege as we experience, N not by force, but rather through inspiration and sharing. But today, I am thankful for the opportunities I have as an American. And now it's time for our great inventor secret of the week. I promised you at the beginning of the podcast that I was going to share a way to refurbish your laptop in just a few minutes. The method here may surprise you. Go grab a sheet of paper. Make three columns. Now in the first column, write a list of the first ten things and the last ten things you use every day. For me, I hear my smartphone's alarm. I roll over in bed and get up, get dressed, go find the bathroom, drink a couple of bottles of water, read a book, go for a walk, like to watch the sunrise, call a couple of friends in the phone, take a hot shower, eat, and then get started on a project, usually with my computer. My evening routine usually starts like this. I check on my kids' homework, I tuck them into bed, I read a little, I turn on the water in the sink, brush my teeth, turn off the water, floss, rinse with some sort of uh, organic mouthwash, crawl into bed, kiss my wife, and turn out the lights. Now, in column two, we won't cover every item in the list, but I just want to touch on three or so. In column two, next to take a hot shower, I write hot water heater, simple propane delivery, insulated copper pipes, temperature selectable water fixture, integrated plumbing and septic tank, soap, shampoo, and a long list of other shower delights. Next to smartphone, I write powerful microprocessor, GPS chip, semi-infinite choice of software, integrated phone call, noise suppression, headphone or Bluetooth audio transceiver, touchscreen, brightness control, and a host of other things. Next to turn off the lights, I write down convenient and safe switches, reliable 110 volt power, windmill power generation, extraneous line frequency suppression, safe wall outlets, fire code compliant Romex wiring, supply of plenty of 15 and 20 amp circuits with convenient circuit breakers, ground fault circuit interrupters or GFCI outlets, and a great many other wonders of technology. Now in column three, let's look back to Ruth and Alex's daily experience. When I visited them, they had just installed a working commode, but the shower wasn't working yet, and getting reliable hot water to accompany the shower was likely to take even longer. Their sewer situation was also a little unpredictable. Now Alex does have a smartphone, but the network he's on is not all that predictable or fast. The power grid where Ruth and Alex live Ah, it's a little dodgy, and their home is most certainly not up to current U.S. electrical codes. I mean, alternatively, I could choose to describe the location of my friend Dan's son Jared, where he lived recently in Africa. Most don't even have access to the technologies I just described. Finish your list and then reflect. When was the last time you just stood and savored the warmth of a clean, hot water coming from your shower? I mean, 
Have you ever put down your cell phone after sending a text or talking to a friend and just marveled at the almost magical ability to communicate with someone in the next room, next city, next state, or on the other side of the world? The last time you flipped a light switch, did it occur to you to wonder just how amazing this technology is that, that gives you this privilege? I'll be honest, I don't do that very often. But one of the best ways to keep the wonder that we described last week in the podcast is never to allow ourselves to take life or its amazing conveniences for granted. So when the laptop starts to act up or isn't as shiny as it used to be, remember this. At the beginning of this podcast, I promised I was going to tell you how to do a quick refurb of your laptop. Curiously enough, this trick also works for cell phones, refrigerators, plumbing, and a host of other modern technology. The secret? The best way to refurbish a laptop in just a few minutes is to find a deep sense of gratitude by keeping a little perspective. We'll then be able to see all the capability that our technology continues to offer. And it'll look quite a bit shinier in the process. Have you been enjoying the Tabletop Inventing Podcast? Have comments or questions you'd like us to address? Contact us and we'll think through the comments and answer your questions here in the podcast. And be sure to let us know if you'd like a shout out or to remain anonymous. You can share your comments and questions at www.ttinvent.com slash podcast or by emailing us at podcast at ttinvent.com. Let's discuss your thoughts and questions. Join us again next time when we will again seek to answer the question, what is the purpose of an education? And as educators, how do we awaken the inventor in each of our students? <music>